Welcome to Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast designed to help biblical Christians witness to their Mormon friends, family, and missionaries. For more Bible-based resources, check out tilm.org. We have all kinds of resources to support you, including classes, witnessing scenarios, books, and so much more. Visit tilm.org today. Welcome to Witnessing Christ in the New Testament. This is Molly. And Mark. Today we are studying two books, but one location, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Mark, give us a rundown. Who are the Thessalonians? Who wrote a letter to them? What's going on? Yeah, so the Thessalonians were one of the groups of people that Paul visited in Macedonia, in the city of Thessalonica. He only got to spend about a month there on one of his missionary journeys before he and the folks that he had been witnessing to started to receive a tremendous amount of persecution, and therefore he had to move on. But Paul has such a fatherly pastoral heart for this group of believers that he had developed a very deep relationship even in that short amount of time that he is still concerned for their spiritual well-being. And so he's reaching back out to them now via what perhaps is one of the first letters written by the Apostle Paul. Um, Most commentators say as early as AD 50 for this first letter. So he's likely writing from Corinth really after his abrupt departure because of that intense persecution that's recorded in Acts chapter 17. And what would you say are the important topics that are covered in these letters? Yeah, so in the first letter, Paul is really focused on first giving thanks for the exemplary lives of faith that the people are demonstrating. He kind of reviews their history in being brought out of idol worship into the trust in the Jesus of the Bible. And he's talking about how they're they're actually being talked about all over the known world of the day because of their faith. But he also sees that they've got some misunderstandings already developing among their teachings. And one of those appears to be a false teaching on um, the timeline involved with the day of the Lord. Um, Some of them are starting to wonder, did we miss out on the day of the Lord? Did Jesus already come back? What's going to happen? What what about those people that have died before the day of the Lord? Are are they out of luck? Uh, what happens when Jesus returns is really their question. And how do we prepare for that? And so Paul is really writing these letters to help them navigate life with an eternal perspective in view of that great day of the Lord's return, but not getting focused on some weird ideas that they had. Mm, Interesting. So as you do with uh, other uh, study guides, you have given us some words to know. Would you highlight some of the most interesting ones? And this is also in the study guide that comes with the notes. Yeah, we'll take a look at the ones for First Thessalonians now, and then we'll come back to the ones for Second Thessalonians later. So one of the, the first words to know is the word parausia. Um, it is a Greek word that refers to the coming or presence of someone. In First Thessalonians, it primarily denotes the second coming of Christ. Uh, this is maybe one place to, to stop just for a moment and really think about what does the second coming of Christ, or as we're going to read about here in just a moment, the, the day of the Lord, um, what does that refer to? Um, for Mormons, they are really looking at the day of the Lord and the Lord's second coming as this time when Christ will come back to then reign on earth for a thousand years, a millennial reign on earth. And it's really during that time that they believe many, many different things are going to happen as part of this new restored kingdom on earth. And kind of it's a a broader concept, the day of the Lord that leads up to and includes the second coming of Jesus. It not only um, includes his return, but they believe in a gathering of Israel. They believe that the gospel will be preached to all nations, that it's a period of divine intervention and judgment. And during this time, people are going to have another opportunity to repent and prepare for the ultimate final judgment. 
Um, it's seen as a, a great period of spiritual activity and prophetic activity. So how would you interpret Day of the Lord from a biblical perspective? Yeah, so I would include it with what they talk about next, which is the final judgment. They believe that this final judgment is a specific event that occurs after the second coming and after the millennial reign. And so one of the things that we want to highlight is unlike Mormonism, where people are given multiple opportunities to come to faith, whether it's in this life, in the spirit world, in this time of the day of the Lord, the second coming, the millennial reign, all the way leading up to a final judgment. It's kind of like you almost get three or four Mm. different opportunities, maybe even more complex than that when you really dive into Mormon doctrine, to really emphasize that no, when we die is really our individual day of judgment, but then there is a great day of judgment when all people of all times and all places will be brought before the Lord. There's not multiple opportunities to come to faith. Hmm. Other favorite words from First Thessalonians? Yeah. Another big one is the word holiness, um, really to think about being set apart for God's purposes. Holiness, um, this comes up in chapters 3, 4, and 5. Um, for Mormons, when they think of holiness, it is really about what they're doing rather than what they have been made to be in Christ. So when we are brought to faith, we are now set apart as people that are holy and sanctified before the Lord. And maybe think about it in this way too, where we've talked in the past about the difference between horizontal and vertical righteousness, um, that vertical righteousness, the right standing we have with God, and now the righteousness in the things that we do as we serve our fellow man. And much of what he's talking about in this book is really the holiness that we demonstrate as sanctified believers among our fellow people. Um, He's going to use words like admonish and encourage throughout this, but probably two of the bigger words are hope and love. He he wants to add acknowledge that they're already living lives filled with hope and love and just to do that all the more. So with the word hope, um, you know, in regular English, it always means something like something according, maybe it'll happen. And, but in the Greek here, does it more certain than that? Or is that just in the biblical context that it makes it certain? And, and I think the definition that I provided in the study guide is, is one that is pretty common for this idea and it's the confident expectation of a future blessing so unlike i hope it doesn't rain today where well it probably is going to no this is a confident this elpis confidence okay all right should we jump into the book yeah let's take a look at first thessalonians chapter one again right away paul starts off by talking about the endurance that these folks have their labor prompted by love and he says this is all based on or inspired by a hope in our Lord Jesus. That's the end of verse 3. In the the opening kind of greeting where he's talking about and giving thanks for the Thessalonians, just the, the kind of thing to acknowledge is that this is one of the few times in the New Testament where Paul is like, guys, you're doing well. Um, like you're, you're serving as a great example, a great model. And he even says in verse eight, your faith in God has become known everywhere. He doesn't say this to cause them to be boastful, but he's saying, look, look what God has done in your lives. Look what the impact of the gospel is having on you and how now your gospel oriented lives are having impact on other people. Maybe one single phrase to pay attention to in that opening paragraphs is in verse 10 where it says and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead jesus who rescues us from the coming wrath why do you think that would be important to highlight well there's so so much so many positive things but all of a sudden we've got the word wrath right here and it makes you pause like oh oh wrath what wrath is still coming and i think it kind of comes out a little bit more in this book about the wrath but for lds they're not worried about wrath for anybody right except for the worst of the worst going to outer darkness and and so i think that is something that we, we do need to focus on is that for those who are outside of christ jesus who has already 
mediated the wrath of God in our place, God's wrath is still an ever-present reality. And throughout these two letters, he's going to bring up this idea of eternal wrath and punishment and talk about the difference between those who believe and those who don't as far as whether or not you're going to Mm -hmm. receive this wrath. All right, anything else from chapter 1? No, uh, chapter 2 is where Paul gets very pastoral. And what I found interesting about chapter 2 is all of the different ways in which in familial, family-oriented terms, Paul addresses them. Um, He addresses them very much like a father, but then he calls them brother and sister. And then in verse 8, he says, just as a nursing mother cares for his children, so we care for you. And then later in the chapter, he goes on and he talks about when we together were orphans separated from you. So it's just all this different language that really shows the kind of family-centered relationship that he had with them. And he is mentioning to them that they are experiencing suffering, experiencing suffering in much the same way that he and his traveling companions are experiencing suffering, but also much in the same way that Jesus experienced suffering. And he's speaking about this to remind them that believers should not feel like they are going to be immune to suffering. If Christ suffered, we also will suffer. Mm. Is that significant to highlight in witnessing at all? I think it is because Mormons are taught that the best are blessed. And if you are living the righteous, moral Mormon life, then things are going to go well. And if you're not, that's when suffering comes into play. And I I think, you know, for Christians too, um, that could be very discomforting. Mm -hmm. If you are taught that if you have some sort of suffering, whether it's physical, emotional, relational, or spiritual in your life, that it's it's on you, that you're you're sinning or you're doing something wrong. And and that's not what Paul's saying here. He's saying, no, you're you're doing the right things. You are living this life as the set apart people of God, and yet you're still suffering. It certainly is a lot easier to find examples of Christians who are suffering more than Christians who are doing great. Who have it perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I also thought that uh, in verse 16. Uh, maybe that's a little significant too that we've got the, the wrath of God highlighted again. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. And in some ways, it's comforting to see that God is going to punish sin. How, if you're suffering because the sinful world, that sin will come to an end. God does not tolerate it, it won't live on. In another kingdom. Yeah, I guess that... Yeah, or another realm. Yeah, yeah. it's yep. gone. And, and, you know, we're often thinking about, oh, if God would just be just. Well, he will be, but in his own time and in his own way. Uh, anything else from that section? No. So transitioning from chapter 2 to 3, Paul is really expressing his sincere desire to be back with the Thessalonians. A number of things are blocking that way. He even says Satan has blocked our way again and again. But he has sent his traveling companion, Timothy, to continue to spread the gospel, strengthen them, encourage them in their faith so that they would not be unsettled by these trials, says verse 3. And now he is talking about this report that um, Timothy has brought back, and he's, he's sad for them that they are experiencing different types of suffering, but he's encouraging them to remain strong in the Lord. And this section as he began with, now closes with a prayer. He says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus Christ comes with all his holy ones. Um, there's those words blameless and holy mm-hmm. there at the end. And this would be a part to, to highlight that. What What is it that makes us blameless and holy on the great day of the Lord? Is not that we have polished ourselves up and somehow managed to climb up the ladder of repentance, the ladder of keeping commandments, but what makes us blameless and holy on that day is is faith in Jesus. And Paul will go on to talk about that in the next chapter. 
And in that section, if you are looking for who's the active agent, it's God. He's the subject over and over and over in this section. He's the one doing the action verbs. The Lord, the Father, yeah. God. Yeah. He's doing the work. Yeah. All right. So what are we looking at in chapter four? Yeah. So in chapter four, he is now giving his brothers and sisters, he refers to them as again, just instruction on how to live a life um, that's pleasing to God. And he says, you're doing it. Um, and he says, just just keep this up as you're sanctified and set apart. He just wants to contrast again. This is how the unbelieving world lives. And this is how those that have been brought into the family of God will live and act. And he reminds them that God is going to punish sin. And so he encourages them to um, turn away from that style of life and live a life as this holy and set apart people who have the Holy Spirit with them. And, and I just love how in verse eight, he, before they're like, how do we do this? You know, how, how do we, how do we deal with this? We're still sinful. He reminds them that the Holy Spirit is yeah. with them. And then he goes on to encourage them that as they live this life, don't, don't be busy bodies. He's going to come back to that in the next chapter too, but make sure that you're, your work working and that you are working in such a way that other people outside of the Christian community will say, wow, that's a, that's a unique group there. Tell us more about them. Tell us more about your God. Mm-hmm. A different motivation for why we should work hard or lead quiet lives. So that next section about believers who have died. This is kind of interesting. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a, a quick transition here. He's he's acknowledging that they might be tempted into certain sins, but now he's really getting to what appears to be the major confusion, and that's were there some people that already died that will miss out on the day of the Lord, or did the day of the Lord already so, happen and we're going to miss out on it? Because they're dead, they miss the the judgment, the final judgment. That yeah, or, tough or, luck. The, or the return of or, Christ. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I wonder if we should read that. Yeah, go ahead portion. and read, starting with verse 13. Molly. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have been who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, Encourage one another with these words. Yeah, so ultimately, Paul wants them to know, you didn't miss it, nor did they miss it. Um, He's saying that both those who died in the Lord and those that are alive when Christ's return will be a part of this great and glorious day. Um, Maybe think of it kind of like a parade, that some people will be in the parade with Jesus and others on the side, but they will all be a part of this beautiful victory day. I also just appreciate the confidence in verse 17. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Yep. There's no question about, you know, well, the, the nicest of you, you are going to go here. And those of you that are okay, you're going to go there. It's just yeah. it's so confident. Yeah. So these verses are some of the verses that cause great conversations and debates among Christians as far as what will happen at the return of Christ, whether he's ushering in a physical millennial kingdom, if there's something like a rapture where certain people are going to be taken and others left. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because when it comes to conversations with Mormons, that's not going to lead them in a, a very healthful direct, healthy direction. We want to focus on proclaiming Christ rather than getting caught up in the nuances mm-hmm. of this day. But as you're looking at it really think through um, the sequence in which um, Jesus is, or Paul is talking about what's going to happen on that day, and read it in the context to to really see what is going to happen on that great day, and why it's a comfort rather than something to leave us questioning or in fear. Mm, That's a good reminder to don't get caught up in the details that ultimately won't lead to to salvation. 
All right, anything else in chapter four? No, so he goes on in chapter five to continue to expand on this day of the Lord. And ultimately, he's, he's again, and this kind of builds on what we were just talking about. He says, now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So really what he's saying is, guys, this isn't the point. Um, the point isn't to get wrapped up on what specific day it's going to happen or what specifically it's going to look like. But are you ready? Are you ready for that day? And he says, you are ready um, because you are not in the darkness, verse 4. Um, he says, you, in verse 5, are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness, so don't let us be like others who are asleep. In this time, he's not talking about those that have already fallen asleep in the Lord, but those that are still blinded, those that are children of the dark. But let us be awake and sober. And then he's going on to talk about that wrath again in verse 9. He says, For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. It's interesting how he uses those two different pictures, like the one of being dead spiritually, but mm -hmm. then dead physically. And he's saying, whether you're dead physic or dead physically or alive spirit physically, as long as you are alive spiritually, you're going to be well prepared yeah. for this day. And again, it's an either or sec section, either you're waking up to wrath or you're going to live with God. Yeah, and then he gives some final instructions for them as they continue to live among each other in peace. He says, don't be idle, don't be disruptive, encourage the disheartened, take care of the weak. And then he closes once again really focused on God and says in verse 23, may God himself, this is beautiful, God of peace, sanctify you, set you apart as holy through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. I love that verse 24. The one who calls you is faithful. Mm -hmm. He's, again, putting the focus not on these, these believers in Thessalonica that are struggling like all of us do. Like, oh, am I strong enough? You say, no, God is the one that is going to bring all of this about in you and through you because mm -hmm. of Jesus. And if you're wondering if uh, you're the one that's putting the work in for sanctification, nope, it's God. If you're wondering if you're the one that puts in the work for blamelessness, nope, it's God again. Yeah. Are you the one that prepares yourself for this day? Nope, God again. Yeah. All right. Second Thessalonians. Yeah. So... We don't know the exact timeline between the writing of First and Second Thessalonians. It appears to be a, a very short period of time. And some historians, commentators of this time period, assume, based on some things that Paul says in the second letter, that perhaps a third false letter was written between First and Second Corinthians that caused the people to be um, brought into further chaos when it came to the day of the Lord. So at the very end, he's going to say, like, look at the way that I write this. This is what my handwriting looks like is pretty much what he's saying. Um, so it appears that either someone had written a false letter or somebody came with false teachings from Paul that made them now filled with confusion when it comes to the day of the Lord. So he has to circle back around to that. And he's also going to talk about how they are to behave and live in preparation from that day of the Lord. It appears that some people had developed that mindset that like, well, he's going to return any day, so we sh we don't need to work. Um, so they started getting lazy and idle. Um, they maybe were think, acting in faith, I guess. They, I, I, yes, they were. <laughs> but but it's those, um, sometimes Christians are accused of being like, they're so heavenly minded that they're of no, no earthly really good. Right. This would be one of those examples of a group of people that was so heavenly minded that they were no earthly good to themselves or anyone around them. So they quit their jobs because they thought, well, Jesus is coming it's maybe coming next back. week or yep. something. And then they became busybodies. Well, that was, yeah. They were annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, uh, words to know. What do you want to tell us about yeah, our keywords? So probably one of the biggest ones is this anthropos teanomias, which is the man of lawlessness, the man of animosity, maybe. Um, it refers to a figure of rebellion and lawlessness who opposes God's authority. Maybe we should just talk about this one right away, that throughout the history of the Christian church, there has been quite a bit of debate as to 
whom or what this man of lawlessness is. Um, one of the things we're going to see is that he was around already during the time of the early Christian church. Um, Paul addresses this specifically in chapter 2, verses 3 through 12. And he says, he's one who exalts himself above God and opposes all that is sacred and true. And it's really a warning against false teachings or ideologies that challenge the authority of God's word and the central message of Christ's redemptive work. Again, throughout history, people have really come up with all certain sorts of people that they would say, this is the one. But it really appears that he was already around at the time or the early footprints of it or the the early stages of it were already taking root during this time and at some point before the coming of the lord the great day of the lord he is going to grow even stronger and it is then that christ will triumph over him so what you're saying is it's maybe not healthy or helpful to become fixated on this person is the man of lawlessness yeah, and there there are certain denominations that will be very specific. Mm-hmm. Um, many in our Lutheran tradition that we're a part of have said that this is the papacy. And there are definitely um, indications that this is not a single pope, but perhaps the whole papacy, line of the papacy that really has set itself up in the house of God and at times is greatly distorting the word of God. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. According to Mormons, they take a different direction in this, and they really say this is talking about the great time of the apostasy. And what is the great apostasy? Yeah, one of the reasons that the Mormon religion says that Joseph Smith was necessary was that for nearly 1,800 years, the true word of God was lost. And they say that this is one of the indications of that, that very early in the church, the gospel was already being lost and would continue to be lost. And then Joseph Smith was the one that would bring about a restoration after this time of apostasy. In one of the LDS commentaries that we take a look at each week, it actually uses Martin Luther um, to emphasize, and they're, they're pulling a, a misquoting out where he's really talking about the Roman Catholic Church of his day and the way that it has corrupted the gospel. He's not talking about the apostasy, though, in the way that the Mormon Church refers to it. So you said the great apostasy started in 18, was 1800 years so right away right is away what they're saying yeah, they, they really believe that the the prophets dropped the ball that very shortly peter the and the apostles didn't do a good job oh and then that the gospel was lost oh man so then earth just never had yeah the gospel so they really, until until joseph, joseph smith, smith restored it yeah. interesting Okay, any other words you want to highlight? Yeah, so he tells them to stand firm. Um, he references that or mentions that three different times in chapters two and three. So to, to be confident as well and to continue to pray. Um, he prays for them five times in these two short letters. He's really just saying stand firm in prayer and be comforted in knowing that Christ has promise to return, and he will, for judgment one day, but that these believers can be well prepared because of the faith that God has given them. Okay, well, let's jump into it. Chapter one, what do you want to highlight here? In the first chapter of Second Thessalonians, Paul again begins with thanksgiving and prayer for the Thessalonians. But he very quickly jumps back into this conversation about the great day of the Lord and wants to let them know what it takes to be prepared for that. And it's really verses 8 through 10 that are so significant. It says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his body, people, and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. He draws a very clear distinction between those who are saved and those who aren't. He really says those who do not know God 
and do not obey the gospel of our Lord. This is kind of a fascinating one to discuss with our Mormon mm-hmm. friends because their ears are going to perk up to that obeying the gospel concept. They yeah, are, I was going to ask about that. They are much more focused on the gospel as a law or a set of things to check off of a list. Where when it comes to obeying the gospel, throughout the Bible, that is really just saying believe. Believe the gospel. And what's so incredible about this gospel command is it is the gospel itself, the good news about Jesus, that creates that ability to believe the gospel. So the command itself gives the ability to believe it. We, we call that um, the gospel proclamation here or the gospel command. So in the next paragraph, I was wondering if you could tell me about in what way Jesus is glorified in believers. So this is verse 12. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think this is a beautiful statement where how is Jesus glorified in believers? Maybe think about it in the sense that glorying in something is to bring it honor or a a definition that I like to use is kind of a, a modern picture of pointing the spotlight at or drawing attention to something to lift it up. And so in this sense, the way in which Jesus is glorified or lifted up in us is by the work that he did to save us and bring us into a saving, faith-filled relationship with him as forgiven children of God and heirs of eternal life. That's glory. Um, So rather than pointing at yourself and saying, look what I've done, when people see what Christ has done in your life, it brings glory to Jesus. So the next chapter uh, has a lot of man of lawlessness in it. And what is the confusion that is brought about here or that Paul is addressing here? Yeah. So the reason he brings up the man of lawlessness is, again, there are some who think that the day of the Lord has already happened And he's letting them know there's a big thing that needs to happen before the day of the Lord. And that's where he brings up this man of lawlessness. Um, A couple of things to draw attention to when it comes to this man of lawlessness is really in verse 8 where it says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will overthrow with the breath of his nostril and destroy by the splendor of his coming. So splendor and glory there again. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but who have delighted in wickedness. And I think ultimately, when it comes to conversations about the man of lawlessness and this idea of what he is doing, really, it's about condemnation and to think about, am I prepared for that day? Do I believe the lies of Satan or am I believing Mm -hmm. the truths of Jesus? Ultimately, that's the difference, not whether you properly understand absolutely who the man of lawlessness is and what he's doing, but am I am I following false doctrine? Am I focused on receiving the true word of God as it is, or am I looking for things that sound good to me, that sound appealing, you know, signs and wonders of power? Um, maybe um, think of even some parts of Christendom today where people are really focused on these big miraculous displays as a sign of faith. And he's saying those can be a deception from God or from Satan. So it appears that dwelling on who the man of lawlessness is with or witnessing conversations is probably not going to get us anywhere, but maybe focusing on the end, the judgment believers and unbelievers would. Absolutely. Okay. So stand firm. Moving on to the next section. Yeah, so once again, he is just encouraging them to build on and grow from the Word of God that has taken root in their life and allow the Spirit to continue to build them up and encourage and strengthen them. He says in verse 17, in every good deed and word. 
And now he's going to ask for their prayers, um, that they would pray for him, that in everything that he does, and as the day of the Lord approaches, that God would be honored and glorified. And then he closes his letter by addressing those believers, those brothers and sisters. Um, He's saying, keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive (laughs) and does not live according to the teaching you have received from us. For you yourselves know you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden on you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Dun, dun, dun. So I think we should just clarify. This isn't really referring to people who have disabilities or they're trying to find a job and they can't find a job. This is for people who are choosing not to work even though they can yeah and they're it appears that they're saying well if jesus is coming back soon then why work right. um it almost seems sinful to work yes yeah. yes because paul always says take care of the poor and yeah. the widows <laughs> but he, that is interesting yeah he goes on and says they are idle and disruptive they are not busy they are busy bodies i guess a good reminder for us too that it's more fun to be lazy and get in other people's business. <laughs> yeah, and, and just the encouragement yeah. to use the gifts that God has given us. Um, this He's really teaching the doctrine of vocation here, that to take the gifts and abilities that God has given you and use those for the glory of God and the good of the people around you. Mm-hmm. Okay, we just got through two whole books of the Bible. What are your favorite things to highlight if you only get to have one or two conversations about Thessalonians? Yeah, I, I think I would focus in on that part in Second Thessalonians chapter 1 where he gives that really clear definition of he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. As really this is the, the definition of who a believer is and who a unbeliever is and maybe connect that with john 3 mm-hmm. and john three sixteen through 18 really the, the difference between belief and unbelief is what matters not how much good someone has done in the eyes of the world or even in the eyes of god okay yeah, kind of simple which maybe that's nice for a week sometimes it is <laughs> yeah. yeah would you pray for our witnessing friends yeah. gracious heavenly father we thank you so much for even simpler books like this, um, maybe not filled with as many deep doctrinal debates or issues, but a, a letter of encouragement, a letter of encouragement that even if we're suffering right now, even if we're being cur- persecuted for our faith, that that should be expected. Um, but also an encouragement that we are as believers, um, children of the light who are prepared for that day of the Lord. But there are many of those that we are seeking to reach that are At this point, children of the dark, they're still asleep spiritually. And before that great day of the Lord comes, we have the the joy and the privilege of going and sharing the truths of Jesus with them. We ask that you would embolden us and empower us this day and always to proclaim your name among the nations. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Molly. See you next week. joining us for this episode of Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth in love ministry podcast. For more resources, visit tilm.org. If this podcast and other truth in love ministry resources have been a blessing to you, consider supporting the mission to proclaim Christ to Mormons and empower Christians to witness by visiting tilm.org backslash give.